everyone and welcome to Journal for Jills. My name is Lewis and in today's episode of JFG Meets we have former Gillingham defender Simon King on the show. Obviously, unfortunately, due to the current coronavirus pandemic we were apart when having the chat so it did have to be a phone interview but do stay tuned for inside stories on Simon growing up in Oxford, adapting quickly at Barnet, the success that followed, joining Gillingham, a transitional period, the promotion season featuring the famous playoff final and pocketing Grant Holt, horrible injury problems, rehab, moving on, life in Scotland, retirement, the potential future and more. Enjoy. So we're now joined by former Gillingham defender Simon King. Simon, thank you for coming on. Um, how are you doing? Uh, no problem, mate. Yeah, all good, thank you. Uh, I'm just busy, busy work at the minute. Um, but no, when, I, when you got in touch, mate, I was looking forward to having a chat and like I said to you before, I was like reminiscing about the old days and especially my time at the Jills. So looking forward to it, mate. Yeah, I think it's fair to say you're a player that's in high demand from a lot of Gillingham fans to hear from, not just because of... <laughs> not just because of your story, but in terms of how good you were for the club, that sort of thing. I think a lot of people have very fond memories. So we'll um, we'll, we'll get into it and hopefully we'll give people some 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 entertainment, a bit of a football fix, a bit of a Jules fix over the next hour or so. Um, cool. See how it goes. So back at the start, um, something we always yeah. ask everyone, how did you get into football originally? Why, why football? Um, I don't know, really. I don't think there's anything that really kind of like pushed me towards football. My dad, my Dad played a little bit, um, and he was never one of those pushy dads who would make me go down and play. But I think it was just one of those things your mates do it as, as a youngster, and I just kind of like got involved and then just fell in love with it, like many other young boys do and young girls nowadays. Yeah, um, it's a great, great sport, and something you make you do with your mates, and you just love doing it. And then, and it just built from there, really. Mate, started training at a local team and got scouted for my local club, which, which then was uh, living in a town called Whitney, uh, picked up by obviously my local team which is Oxford United so it just kind of like progressed through there really and how did you get picked up by Oxford did you just sort of like playing and scouts came to see you yeah I, some of, I don't know how true it was but at the time we'd, I don't know if you remember like when, you, when you're a kid and you play for your local team it was in the cup competition cup finals played at the old Manor ground which is Oxford United's first yeah. team ground yeah. and uh, yeah we played there and someone said there was someone in the stands watching then and someone said it was Steve McLaren but because right. he used to be Oxford ass- assistant back then yeah. Um, so I don't know how true that is but yeah that basically stemmed from there really got scouted got a letter through your door back then um, just asking me to go and train with Oxford United and obviously not the first team back then it was obviously kids but it was all part of like um, like the youth and I can't remember what it was called now. it was it used to be called the Centre of Excellence Yeah. Um, so yeah just just there's a few of the other lads picked up from my local team. Yeah, it just it just yeah, stemmed from there, and then you just go and you come and playing playing for your local team, but you also train with Oxford United through the week. Yeah. So you start getting some some obviously good coaches, um, and that's how you kind of like start learning your trade and you you progress from there. Really, I got picked up quite late. I think it was under eleven, under twelve, because I remember a few a few of the other lads in my local team were all, all already on Oxford's books, and I was kind of like feeling a bit dejected I was thinking this is my chance have I wasted my chance I know I was only young then but when you see your other mates on the books of professional clubs and that you, you start getting a bit worried but then my time come and yeah got the, got the letter through the door and um, started training with the centre of excellence and it, it just kind of like you gradually go through the under 12s under 13s under 14s and then obviously you're at school secondary school then and then um, when you leave school you get offered uh, back then it was called a YTS scheme yeah. Um, yeah. So I got offered one of them. I think that was my last year of school, so I kind of like knew I was going straight into football as soon as I left school, which was which was my dream. Really, a lot, a lot of um, people would love to do that, and I've been offered it, so I was absolutely delighted at the time. I remember just being on top of the world and a chance to kind of like play full time football as soon as I left school, which was delighted and really looking forward to it. Is that at sixteen ish? Is it? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, as soon as you leave school, you start the YTS, which. Which I look back now is some of the best days of my life because you you kind of like with um with your mates, literally ten twelve hour days. You'd get in get in early. You had to prepare all the first team kits. You you got allocated certain pros. You'd have to look after them and make sure their boots were ready. Make sure their boots were clean. Yeah. Um, get their first team training kit ready. So you had a lot of jobs to do, and then then we'd go training. Um, and then we'd have to get all obviously the training equipment ready for the first team. It was all stemmed around the first team, and it it kind of. Like, put me in good stead really it looked, cause obviously you had to be quite respectful to them because they were their first team uh, and it taught you many lessons in life really uh, that period 
Yeah. And like I said, I look back and really fond memories because you do really build up good, strong bonds with a lot of the lads there. And, um, back then we had a good good bunch of lads as well. And like I said, you get spent so many hours with them. You obviously go off training and then you come back and then you quite often do a double session because you're a young kid then so you're still learning your trade. So you'd still, still be working hard and then youth team games on a Saturday and then you'd go back and watch the first team and obviously aspire to be in their position and try and make it make it as a professional footballer. I ended up getting offered a professional contract a little bit early, so I was still kind of like half and half. And then one of the youth team lads coming through had to do my boots and was yeah. in the position I was a year before. So, yeah. But yeah, I just remember them times, it was just, just loads of jokes, loads of pranks, um, tipping buckets of water out when you're like, from the top stand down and there's the lads below you who clean yeah. on the boots especially in the winter weren't nice when it's like, oh, <laughs> cold bucket of water like yeah. um, getting locked in where the ball covered was um, people hiding people's like clothes and that yeah it was just because obviously you're what 16, 17 you're lads are mischievous at that age and you just want to have a laugh as well at the same time as learning your trade so yeah it was a great time and then that was that stage really and then unfortunately it gets harder and harder and to get to that elite level, you have to put the hours of graft in, and then fortunately enough, I got offered a professional contract with a, I think it was a couple of other lads at the time. Yeah, yeah, and like you say, you went on to be a pro at Oxford, played sort of a handful of games. What are your memories from the club as a sort of senior player? Because I know you played in the last game at the Manor Ground as well, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was obviously to a homegrown lad. I think the fans you, they want to see the kind of the youngsters coming through. Yeah. Um, and for me personally, being being from Whitney and going to the old manor ground and watching the games with my dad when we were young, like he, when I was younger, him taking me up there and they were, they were a decent team back then. I think they were a very successful team and watching them was brilliant. And then to finally make my debut uh, on the last ever game at the manor was was something special. And yeah, that's just it's great memory. Like, no one no one can take that away from me. And yeah, really, I, yeah, I, I was never really bitter towards Oxford because that, that was my that was my hometown club kind of thing. But it was just it was more frustration really. It's just just never really got that chance. Um, looking back, I might not have been good enough. You don't know really, but I think that at the time it was difficult. Uh, we had a string of managers who maybe didn't show show faith in the youngsters, but yeah. I suppose there's a lot, a lot of pressures on managers, isn't there? They they need instant success, so maybe the, maybe the timing wasn't right. Maybe I could have forced this. You try to get on loan and get some more games because I'm playing regularly for reserve team football, but that's nowhere. It's good for your fitness now, but it doesn't compare to first team football. So yeah. maybe I should try to get on loan and try and force the manager's hand a bit. I think I was quite shy, quite quiet back then. So I probably just went along with it, and unfortunately, time was running out and just didn't get that, didn't get that chance. I never really got a run in the team. I think I played a few other games after that. I think it's three or four in total, and I think for me to, to kind of like to make that step in my professional career, I needed to needed to leave Oxford, and like I said, I. It was heartbreaking at the time, but I think everyone had things for a reason. It, it probably worked out the best thing I could have done in the end. Yeah, 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 it does seem that way. And in terms of leaving yeah. the club, you say it was hard and um, and stuff like that, moving to Barnet. How did the move, well, first of all, how did the exit happen from Oxford and then how did the move to Barnet happen as well? Um, yeah, the exit was, it was difficult to take really because I've just, I don't, I think there was a few youngsters at the time, um, we'd all been offered three year contracts, so when you that's a quite a long term deal really. So we we all thought we'd have a good chance and maybe start start progressing the first team and at the time it was me, like called Chris Yaki, played for Millwall, Hearts, yeah. went on to have a good career, Dean Dean Whitehead, Sam Ricketts, and like called Jamie Brooks was very close to signing for Arsenal but he unfortunately got an illness which completely wiped him out and never really recovered from that. But yes, yeah, so we had a good good couple of lads coming through and then I just remember I'd, it was in the summer and I had a year left at Oxford and they called me in the office and just said I'm kind of like surplus to requirements now um, I wasn't needed really um, and they were looking to pay me out of my contract so I was a little bit naive I think I jumped in and agreed it straight away and right. the previous day I'd, I'd had a chat with Martin Allen um, obviously you've come across Martin Allen being man, ex the manager yeah. Um, yeah I had a meeting with him me and my um, my actual youth team coach Mike Ford um, he come with me because obviously he'd seen me for the last few years. I've worked closely with him, and he obviously wanted me to do well. And I think he knew it was time to leave Oxford. Um, yeah, so I had a chat with Martin Allen. Yeah, no, it was all positive. It was all 
it was all just basically look, you got a chance to come and play first team football at Barnet. Although it was stepping down to the conference, um, it was a good opportunity for me. Um, yeah, so I took it. Yeah, signed signed a contract, signed a two year deal at Barnet, and then I uh, wasn't driving that time, so it was always difficult. So I had to try and get down to London, uh, move in. All 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 kind of like, all happened so soon. I remember my mum getting really upset because obviously it was a younger lad leaving, yeah. uh, leaving home, and it, it kind of happened overnight, really. So she didn't have time to prepare, but that was me. I was off, packed my bags, said goodbye. To be, to be honest, Martin Allen, he was great. He, he helped me find a place to move into because when you tw- oh, what was I twenty twenty one? It's it's all it's very daunting. It's quite a big move, especially I was from Oxford and moving down to London, a big city. It was um it was tough and yeah, Martin Allen kinda of looked looked after me, found me found me a flat, found me somewhere to live, just near the training grounds so obviously I wasn't driving, so and that was it really. That first season was, was difficult with Barnet. I, I was a little bit homesick, I was kinda of like missing my family and my friends. But at the, at the same same time it was a great opportunity to start playing some first team football and start establish myself. I'm I'm twenty one and where I live yeah. in, where I live where I live in Kent, Gillingham sort of area. Um at uni I'm up in London and my mum is still like emotional every weekend on going back, that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> She's still yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, did you know many people at, at Barnet or were you sort of completely on your own? I probably recognise a few names, there's a few experienced players there at the time with Danny Maddox, Ian Hendon, so I probably heard of them in terms of football. Yeah. But in in the case of actually knowing them personally, no, I didn't know anyone, so it was completely yeah, completely new to me and it made me grow up in a way, kind of thing. I was kind of like stuck in stuck in a row because I was in my comfort zone. Um, I was going out probably a little bit too much with my mates. I was okay. kind of the local lad, the local boy who played for Oxford. So you get a bit of attention from that. And and then I just needed to do it. And yeah, like you said, I didn't really know anyone. So in that respect, it kind of helped me grow up a little bit and mature into a young adult. Because it's kind of like your kind of age, so it was all it was all quite difficult but and quite daunting. But sometimes you just need to do this really for your football career. And I think I look back and it's probably the best thing I could have done. Yeah. So no regrets. Yeah. And do you think maybe, like you said about growing up and that, do you think maybe dropping down to non-league helped that as well in terms of the physicality of the game? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because back then the conference was very physical. Yeah. Um, it was a, yeah, it was a physical league, and I think they're kind of like renowned for it. When it back then the conference was always a bit more physical than football league. So yeah, we're scared of dropping out of the football league. Um. But like I said, it was something I needed to do. That first season, I, I did find it hard. I never, I was still playing left back, which I didn't didn't enjoy as much. Um, we had experience back four, and I, I was quite like a little bit shy, a little bit timid, a little bit kind of like in my shell a little bit. Um, and it wasn't until uh, probably halfway through that season, maybe when Paul Fairclough came in, he moved me to start playing centre half. I started coming out to my shell, coming out of my shell, got a little bit more confident. Uh, maybe just getting getting settled really. Um, I started playing a bit better football, and that season we went on to well, ironically we lost to Shrewsbury again in the in the playoffs. Yeah, uh, on penalties, which was a bit of a shame. But obviously, the following season we bounced back and managed to win the conference. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I just wanted to touch in terms of the context of it being a Julian yeah. Channel and Martin Allen. Um, you played yeah. you played under him almost a decade before he came became Gillingham manager. I think at Gillingham he was renowned renowned for being a bit of a character. He's like, I don't know if you've seen the video of him falling down the stairs in the dugout, that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> I've heard some stories about um, the, like, the stuff he made the players do, like jumping in the swimming pool down the road in their training gear, gear that sort of thing for many players. <laughs> I'm sure every, every player's worked under could tell you a few stories about Martin Allen. A few of my personal ones was, uh, one, one was a little bit negative from my point because I think back then I was a little bit, kind of fancy myself as a pig bit of a pretty boy and he used to dye my hair and I just remember playing one game at half time I, I didn't have the greatest games and he, he basically hammered me and told me to shave my hair off <laughs> uh, I, I did silly it was that time you know when Bex had the blonde Mohique and I kind of like did one of them in the back of my hair yeah. I didn't, didn't go down too well and I was supposed to be an <laughs> horrible conference defender but <laughs> I wasn't doing my job so I, I did get a bit of hammer in and he'd tell me to get that shaved off before you come in Monday um, yeah and a few other bits which on a positive note from Alan was um I thought it was good. Um kinda of like his his character and his managerial style. He, I think I can't remember I think it's for an FA Cup game, but he took us all up to London to go to the theatre. Yeah. Um it was just it was just little things like that which attention to detail, a distraction maybe just to get us away but to get us together. Um so that was a nice touch I thought. And we actually trained up in Hyde Park, somewhere like that. So I always remember losing my wash bag and it had my wallet and my phone next oh. on the day. 
so it was a nightmare. So yeah, just little things like that. It just it's so unexpected, but in the same way, it probably it was probably quite good because a bit of team bonding, going up London, training at Hyde Park, going to um, going to the theatre. Uh, it's just something you wouldn't expect, but you look back and you think they're good times, kind of things. You start building those bonds bonds with other players and. Yeah, so Martin is certainly a colourful character, but I've got nothing but respect for him, and he looked after me really well at Barnet. So, yeah, and also he was he was the one who actually signed me and gave me that chance. So I'll always be very grateful towards towards to him, kind of thing. I think I'm right in saying he left bef- just before the end of that season, where you miss- missed out in the playoffs. Um, to yeah, that's right. Like you say, a bit ironically to Shrewsbury, but obviously we'll come on to that. Um, yeah. Did you say you struggled that first year then in terms of moving away that sort of thing? Yeah, I think that didn't help. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a big step for me, and I don't, I don't think I didn't have the best of seasons personally. I, um, but then it's, it was all a learning curve. So we obviously, we obviously done a while. So we obviously made the playoffs. Um, yeah, I think Martin Allen left towards the end. I think he went to Brentford, if I remember rightly. Yeah, Brentford. I think. Um, I think it was. Yeah, I think it was. It was a learning curve, like I said. And I started. I, was, I played quite a lot of games. I, played, I think I played about 35, 40 games, which isn't bad for your first kind of like full season. So, yeah, it was just getting used to the football, the regular first team football, because it, it does take a strain on your body, especially at a young age when you're still developing, still learning the game. Um, so, but I think it all put me in good stead. The physicality of the conference, um, it kind of like, yeah, I, I, I think it was all good, good learning curve for me. Yeah. And then, like you say, yeah. you mentioned Paul Fairclough and um, yeah. him coming in. You went on to walk yeah. the, walk the league, I think it's fair to say, the following year. But how was it? How was it under him? Because there's a bit of a different style of play. Um, maybe <laughs> yeah. maybe something you enjoyed a bit so, more yeah. as well. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's his style of management kind of like suited me a little bit more. Um, like I said before, I touched on it. He moved me to centre half, which. I enjoyed a lot more, um, especially the style of football he wanted to play. He wanted he encouraged us to play out from the back, yeah. um, which which suited me because I was quite comfortable on the ball. I was kind of have been, and I enjoyed that aspect of it because I like getting on the ball. And I think when I was out on left back, I didn't, didn't feel involved as much. So switching over to centre centre back, um, I enjoyed it much more. And I think when you start enjoying your football, you start putting the performances and start playing a little bit better. Um, so yeah, he was good for me. And, he helped help my career come along nicely, and at the time we had a, we had a good young hungry hungry team back then. We 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 liked to play football. We got the ball down from the back, and nine times out of ten that would lead to goals, kind of thing. We had Grazioli up front who was scoring bags yeah. of goals that season. So looking at it on paper, we did have a decent team back then, and like you said, we we did win that conference fairly convincingly and scored a lot of goals and played some entertaining football. And I don't I don't know if you've been to the Underhill, but that is a hell of a slope on the pitch. So we 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 knew when we were going up the hill, if we could keep it quiet and keep a clean sheet, we knew nine times out of ten we'd dominate going down the hill and score a lot of goals and play some great football, which we did. Yeah, and I think that's a bit. Maybe it was a bit of a shock to the other teams because, like you say, it was very physical in the national league back then as well. So if yeah. Barnet rock up and play football, it's a little bit different. Different. Thing, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, and I think yeah, we we did we did play some good football. We had a couple of good wingers. We had some clever players on our team as well. We had a few went on to have decent careers in the game. Nicky Bailey won uh, to mention. We had the experience of Ian Hendon right back. His quality on, on the ball was second to none. Um, we had Gratz with the goals up front. So we had we, we had a good team then. We and a lot of most of the players were in similar similar boat to me, where we'd been released from like, professional outfits like Oxford, and um, we all had a point to prove. Really, we had yeah. that. We had that bit between the teeth where we had been released and we wanted to show what we could do really, show that, that maybe there was a mistake letting us go and we wanted to get back into the Football League as soon as we could. Yeah, and what do you yeah. remember from the title winning season and winning the league? Um, yeah, it was just, these are the kind of moments you live for where you, you want to look back and you want to be able to tell your grandkids or your mates, yeah, I remember winning that conference and being successful and it was just... That's when you kind of, like, you know, it's like when you start winning things, that's when you become really close to your players, you build that bond. Yeah. Um, but I think that's what winning does. And I just remember having good, a good couple of nights out after that and just all being together, like it's not second to none and just the buzz around the place. It lifts everyone, not only the fans, but all the staff and the people around the area. Kind of everyone, everyone gets involved and it's good really because Barnet was a little family club and I'm sure if you speak to all the fans, they tell you how good it was that season just just to 
come away winning that conference and having a great time, great celebrations, and then you have the summer off, and then you're looking forward to to challenging yourself in league football. And going into league football, what were the aims in the first season? Because a lot of the time people say they want to consolidate their position, that sort of thing. Was that the aim or did the club want more? Yeah, yeah one thing I forgot to mention, Paul, Paul Fairclough, he, was, he liked to meet and we used to have a, like it must have been a weekly meeting, we used to set our set our stall out on every, like, I think it was like five or six games, how many points we wanted to get from the next five, next six. Okay. So, so actually going into that season, I don't think we really kind of like, put down where we want to finish the league or anything I think we won't obviously go into the league league, do, try and do the best you can but it wasn't until yeah. the league started then you start analysing the next six games looking what points you can get and setting yourself targets in that respect so but I think when you had that winning mentality from the youth season before you think you're kind of like invincible so but then it, it is quite a big step up it's, it's, it's tough going from the conference to the to football league I think the teams are much more organised yeah. Um, I think some some of the conference teams are still part time, so you got the fitness side of it as well. Yeah, um, and we were quite a small, we had quite a small squad, and the starting eleven we needed that our strongest eleven out to kind of like do well. Yeah. And I think we started a few injuries start creeping in, and I don't know if we signed many players that so I can't really remember, but it, it was. I think you can just get into the league and then see how it goes, and then you just want to make sure you stay in that football league. Yeah, I think that's the best way to do it, really breaking it down. Because rather than being like, oh, we want to come 15th this season, like you've got to go about how you get that. So, um, Yeah, exactly. Good way exactly. To do it. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And I think it was the two seasons you had a Barnet in the football in the football league. In, in, um, that's right. In, back up there. Um, first year, 18th. Second year, 14th. Um, how, yeah. were, how were they for you? Um, yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the buzz of being a football league player and it was nice. I was starting to... Obviously, each season, I, was, I felt like I was getting stronger, getting better, getting more, just learning my trade, really. I was still at a young age, but I felt more confident in my performances, and um, it was all going well, really. I was a lot more settled. Um, yeah, so it was, um, yeah, it was good times. I look back and have nothing but fond memories of playing it. Um, I had, a, yeah, another two seasons in the Football League, and then. That's when the move to Jill's come along. Uh, Andy Hestyler come come to Barnet towards the end of uh, this is my second season. Uh, sorry, my fourth season, my second season in the football league. Yeah. And I think he had something to do with getting the move to Gin Lim. I think he recommended me. Um, so yeah, it was it was good times, and I'd like to have kicked on a bit. And I think after the four years I'd spent with Barnet, I kind of played. I think it's under six hundred seventy games, so I was. Maybe ready, ready for the next challenge in my career. I felt like I was maybe good enough to make the step up. I just just waiting for something to happen, really. And maybe rewinding a little bit, but I'm sure it's a career high for you. This is the game game at Old Trafford, start of the 05-06 of course, season. Yeah. Um, how was that? How was that for you as a young player? Yeah, it was great. It was um, it was quite nerve wracking for me because I think the game before I was on four yellow, so right, yeah. I think if I'd have got booked, I would have missed that game. Oh. So I was obviously a little bit worried about that, and I think we ended up getting turned over somewhere away to Mansfield or somewhere like that. So I'll try and tend to forget about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, building up to it, it was um, yeah. I just remember, I think I think the draw was on the Sunday. I just remember my phone going crazy. Obviously, when everyone saw the draw. Um, yeah, so, so just to think when you're growing up and playing down your local field with your mates, to, uh, 15, 20 years' time you're playing at Old Trafford, it kind of needs to pinch yourself, really. Yeah. Um, especially such an iconic kind of club, huge, huge club like Man United to get drawn away from home as well and to play, play at Old Trafford. And just very surreal. And I just remember the moment when you kind of look across when you're coming out of town and you see Sir Alex, you think, geez, <laughs> it's all very surreal. Like, but. Yeah. No, them big games. I enjoyed them big games because you want to challenge yourself against the best. I know that I, I think they obviously didn't have any of their big big hitters out, but they still had a very good team. Um, yeah. So yeah, it was good. It was just just a shame, obviously, how the outcome with um, unfortunately Ross Flitley. Obviously, he comes to the jewels, didn't he as well? Yeah, Ross Flitley yeah. got sent, sent off, and I felt a bit sorry for the lad. He obviously got replaced because he didn't even touch the ball, which yeah. was a shame. But these things happen in football. It's, um, but yeah, just it was just a pleasure to play at such a such a lovely stadium, and basically, I think there's still about forty five, fifty thousand there. So good crowd, and having all your friends and family come to the game, and all buzzing for you. To, 
have a chance of playing there. So and we scored as well. It was nice to get a goal. Just yeah. give the Barnet fans something to celebrate. I know we've got we lost four one, but it's still still to score just to give the Barnet fans a little little cheer. Like I'm sure that made their night. Yeah, but it's all experience. It's all a learning curve. So yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And it's one of the things I'll never forget. Like yeah, it's weird. Like you say you. are you're, you're playing with your mates and then you're rocking up at Old Trafford and then the way the, way the game goes and then your keeper gets sent off after two minutes like it's just crazy oh, how this things happen isn't it <laughs> you couldn't think yeah you couldn't obviously you couldn't have written that because you had a worse outcome yeah. in the first two yeah. minutes <laughs> I think as a centre half you go into the game so you like stay solid the first 15 20 minutes and then start getting the ball down and playing but then obviously yeah. a little bit different and before you know it, we were down to 10 players at Old Trafford oh bloody hell what's, <laughs> what's the outcome of this going to be especially the centre half we did <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We did alright in the end. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was good. It was a good experience. I know we lost and that, but we we weren't expected to get much anyway. So yeah, it, yeah. Was, a, it was good. And so oh, I'll never forget about that night walking out on Old Trafford. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So you said a bit about um, Andy Hesentai's influence in you going to Gillingham, um and you wanted a new new challenge. But how did the departure come about? Yeah, I think I was coming into my last year, and I think we we come close to the kind of sorting out a new contract to Barnet uh, but I can't remember the ins and outs obviously you don't like, like I said before in football you don't really know much what goes on behind the scenes um, so yeah I think I was coming into my last year and I think they didn't want my contract to run down because I can't I don't think I decided not to sign a new contract I think that's what it was right yeah so, that, so they end up transfer listing me which sounds worse than it is but it wasn't me throwing my like, toys out of the pram or anything it was just a case of Barnett wanted to get some money for me I was running going into my last year of the contracts and they didn't want me walking around a free yeah. which is understandable isn't it so any money they could get would be a bonus for a club like Barnett so it wasn't it wasn't any it wasn't anything horrible going on it wasn't oh, I've done anything wrong sticking on the transfer list it was just a case I think they wanted to get some money from while well they could so yeah then before, before I know it I was having a look around Gillingham and very impressed with the stadium and had a chat with a few people and obviously Hesse was a big colour. He persuaded me, not persuaded me, I didn't need to take much persuading, but obviously Hesse and Tyler's a Gillingham legend, isn't he? So yeah. he, was, he, he filled me in about obviously the ins and outs of Gillingham Football Club and it kind of like, it just, it just felt right at the time and I think you do have to go with your gut sometimes. It just felt good, the club it's a big club isn't it but down in the midway so it was a new challenge for me and it's a step up into League One which as a footballer you want to try and play the best of your ability and try and reach reach as high as you can go so yeah yeah. it it, it does bother me sometimes when clubs let, let good players run down their contracts but then I suppose you've got to weigh up the success you're going to have with the players um, yeah. or the money that sort of thing and for a club like Barnet maybe that money would have would have helped quite a lot yeah yeah, exactly. I yeah. think it was at two hundred grand, wasn't it? So yeah. you don't know what kind of like, you don't really know the ins and out the financial side of it. But I, I suppose it was an offer they couldn't turn down. So that was that was kind of like done and dusted. But there was no bitterness towards Barnet when I left. It was nothing but a good, happy four years I spent there. And with Barnet, you kind of like, you get to know a lot of the people around the club as well. Cause it's such a such a family club that like even after the games, you go into the bar and you see see a lot of the same faces and fans and. We start to build a nice bond up with, with the majority of them, and so it was sad to leave. Um, it, it's always sad, especially when you've had a successful period there and winning the conference and that. So it, it was sad to go, but it was kind of a new challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. I don't know if you've been back since, but I'm sure if you go back, you always get a positive um, welcoming and that sort of thing. So, like you say, no, yeah, no hard feelings or anything. Um, yeah, no, that's it, mate. That's it. We'll go on to to the big one, Gillingham. Um, <laughs> stepping up into League One, then, like you say, um, what were the challenges and your aims, and for the club as well, what were the aims that season, your first year? Yeah, well, I think after signing, I think I think there was a lot of talks about maybe us going going for promotion. Um, yeah. We had, I think we had quite an aging squad, but I had some good names in that squad. But for some reason, I don't really know what happened. It was, it just didn't work. Did it that first season I signed? Um, yeah. Ronnie Jepson didn't last long. Um, then Mark Stimson come in. But for me personally, yeah, I just wanted to kind of establish myself as a League One footballer. I wanted to kick on to the next level um, and just keep progressing. Really, I think I can't remember what age I must have been. What twenty four, twenty five? So it was a good time for my fat, fit, and health. In I wanted to be 
want to try and be successful and try and be part of a successful drilling team. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I don't really know. It's all a bit of a haze that first season. There's so much going on. Yeah. So many players coming and going. It was a completely different squad by the end of the year, by the end of the season. Yeah. Um, which is crazy when you think about it. You, you don't really see that very often. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was it was tough times. Um, but yeah, for, for me personally, you just got to try and. It's not, it's not to do with me, is it? What goes on, and you just got to try and do your best and keep putting the performances and try and help Jules. Well, eventually try and help him stay up. But unfortunately, we didn't quite do that that season and went back down to League Two. Yeah, I, I think so, if, if you're doing well and helping the team, then progressing as a player comes naturally anyway, doesn't it? Um, exactly. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. All the stuff going off the off the pitch is out of your hands. You just got to do what you're what you want to do, and that's that's try and put some good performances in. Um, I didn't have a too bad a season that year. Obviously, I look back and you just think of the relegation. So, but on a personal yeah. note, I felt all right in League One. I don't think I was out of my depth. Yeah. Um, just unfortunately, we couldn't stay up. And it was, it was, it was a good experience. We've got some good teams back then in League One. There was obviously Leeds. We got relegated at, didn't we, the last game of the season, which was devastating. But yeah. that was a blow. But you if it doesn't break your colour it makes you stronger doesn't it so yeah. So that yeah, that season was it was it was difficult and there's a lot of chopping and changing but the personal note I think I, I did, it didn't be too bad um, so yeah yeah and I, I said to you before we started recording but I'll say it for the camera as well it was my first my first game was during that season um yeah, October November, um, losing at home to Port Vale. We actually went one 0 up, Chris Dixon that game, but then went on to lose, which is disappointing. But um, oh, did we? Uh, yeah, yeah. Because I remember because I was I was in the, at the front of the town end in the rain, and I remember getting the ball in the warm up, <laughs> and I had no idea. Like, do you keep the ball? Do you give it back? I didn't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. Put it under your jumper, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that a few games that season where we, I think we did go to the lead a few occasions, didn't we? And got pen back and yeah. Um, yeah, so it's disappointing, but fortunately enough, obviously, I'm sure we're going to go and talk about it, but we bounced back the following season, which is, I think that was a testament to some Gillingham as a football club. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think that was the same season Bournemouth went down, didn't they? And look where they are now. It's crazy looking back. Like, <laughs> yeah. <how> cra- <laughs> oh, did they, yeah? I, yeah, think so. I, was, I was watching a review, and I think, yeah, I think they were struck that year we got promoted. They were struggling to stay up in League 2 it's crazy to think they're an established Premiership Premier League team now aren't they I know, so I know. it's mental it's crazy how football can change <laughs> but I suppose that's why you love football isn't it like yeah yeah you never know, you know, know. Could, I mean, it's just... could be your club next that sort of thing so. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned the change of manager pretty early, um, Ronnie Jepson obviously yeah. departing, Mark Stimson coming in um, how did that change things around the club and for you personally as well because you've just signed under a different manager yeah, yeah. For me personally, it was great. I, I highly rated uh, Mark Stimson. For me personally, it was brilliant for me. Um, I think he, I think he rated me. Obviously, he played me a lot. So, but he's, he's one of those managers. He just gave you the confidence to play. Uh, he likes to play football. He really tried to get the ball down. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's start to show in the promotion season, but yeah, we wanted to. He liked to play football the right way, and um, he encouraged that for me. And he, he gives you that confidence to to do that. Um, and it's all it helps your game when you know managers kind of got belief in you. Um, there's nothing worse than if a manager doesn't, and you know as soon as you make one mistake, he could be out of the team. But I, I never felt that with him. I always felt like he would kind of like back you, um, which is a testament to his managerial kind of his traits of being a good manager. Um, so yeah, he was nothing but good for me. Uh, I enjoyed working with him. He brought in a completely different style of training with Danny Ellis. The, I think he's an ex-boxer, so we've done a hell of a lot of fitness work when they come in. Because yeah. I think as a whole, I didn't mention that in League One, I didn't feel nowhere near as fit as I should have done or as fit as I've done in previous seasons. Okay. So, I don't, yeah, so I don't know whether the fitness regime wasn't quite up to scratch or... Um, but no, as soon as Mark Stimson and his staff come in, it, things completely changed, like the fitness... We were so much fitter, and I think that definitely showed in the promotion season. Yeah, I was going to say, you could um, notice that team, that team was fit. Yeah, yeah, I think that we did work on that. Like I, I think I've mentioned it before, but Tuesday, she's a bit a day from hell because we had Wednesdays off. So. so the fitness was good. But yeah, like I said to him, I was nothing but good for my career and it's helped me progress. And he kind of, I learned a lot from him. And like we spoke about earlier, we um we did get relegated that season for for whatever reason. And yeah, Mark Simpson sort of saw saw the season out. Um, didn't leave after going down. 
uh, which proved to be a yeah. right decision because he got us back up. Like you say, the, the team changed quite a lot, but did you feel like it was a bit of a transition period? I did, yeah, because I think when I first signed it, it was quite an ageing squad. Okay. Um, so they were, I think, by the looks of it, it looked like they wanted to go different direction, maybe bring some youngsters in, um, bring some some lads from non-league, which I think at the time was a little bit... I think a few few people weren't, you heard murmurs that weren't too happy with the signings, but yeah. I personally believe that it was kind of like it needed to be done really. You need to get those like hungry players in who maybe have dropped out of the league and want to prove a point, like similar to what I was when I when I signed for Barnet. Like, so yeah. I didn't see no problems with that. Um, yeah, so it was. I could definitely say it was transitional period, um, and it was always going to be tough. I think most of them said his hands tied kind of like in that first season. Um, we would need a miracle to stay up with the amount of chocolate change that was going on off and off, off on and off the field. Um, so yeah, maybe maybe it happened kind of could it happen for a reason. It was kind of a fresh start. He got the squad he wanted to uh, start the next season, and then we kicked on from there, and obviously led on to the, the amazing Wembley. Yeah. Um, was the aim as soon as we went down just to go straight back up? I think so, yeah. I think I think you're obviously still devastated about the relegation, but you need to try and block that out. You need to concentrate on the season coming. But I can't, I can't remember. I don't, I don't think we went into it overly confident. I think we were building a good squad. Yeah. Um, Simeon Jackson was there by then, wasn't he? Yeah, and, yeah, um, yeah. You knew he would get his goals. And I think you start building up good partnerships with players around you and you start getting used to your teammates a bit more and... I think we're going in the right direction, which I think that's all you can ask for after being relegated. Um, cause obviously, a lot of things change. Um, the whole mentality of the club was probably on a bit of a downer that summer. Yeah. So you need to try and bounce, bounce back, but I think that's easier said than done sometimes. Um, so, yeah, I think the main thing was we were going in the right direction. We were building a strong squad, um, some good players come in, coming in, and then you just have to go into that season. You you kind of like do have to have that belief that you can go on and get promoted, but you just don't know with... Lead two, it's, it's still a tough league, and there were still some decent teams in there. And on your day, I think a lot of teams can beat anyone. Like so, yeah, yeah. I think a lot of the time teams go down, and then they just sort of rot in that league for a few years. So it's it's yeah, a lot tougher, right, right. a lot tougher than you might think to go back up again. Um, yeah, exactly. And you mentioned the um, sort of new signings and stuff like that, and the, the squad that came together. And I remember it was one of my favourite defences, the likes of Simon Royce, um, yeah. yourself, Gary Richards, John Nutter, Barry Fuller, those sort of people. Um, yeah. Barry Fuller said at Gillingham now, like, it's, it's mental. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, obviously, he's going to yeah. come back, but like, he's, he's an absolute unit. But um, <laughs> Yeah, he is. He's always been like that, mate, absolute machine. Yeah. It, it, it's, respect for him, yeah. It's nice because when. Um, like I'm sure you're aware, but Simon Royce is the goalkeeping coach now at Gillingham, and um, yeah, yeah. when that was announced in summer, it was sort of like all the memories come back, that sort of thing. But, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's nice. But um, I was part of being that defence that season because I think you and you and Gary Richards, you complemented each other well, that sort of thing. And every now and again, we'd see quite a few goals, but then we keep some clean sheets as well. Yeah, it was crazy when I look back. So I look back at some of the fixtures that season, and yeah, so for some reason we, we seem to have a habit of. Once we can see one, we go on and see a few more kind yeah. of thing. So maybe uh, we switched off a little bit when we were losing games and conceded silly goals. But but then again, we kept twenty clean sheets that season, so it was crazy, really. So there was that's definitely something there with that back four, back five. Yeah. Um, Royce, Royce was a great keeper. Um, obviously, like you said, you touched on that. Me and Gary started building up a good partnership. We complemented each, each other's game quite well. He was the one who headed it and. Had a tussle with a stroke as well. I tried to, yeah. I let him do all that. Like, I didn't want to get. <laughs> I wanted to keep my looks like. Do you know what I mean? I think I was still single then, so but <laughs> there were no black eyes or anything. Got um, your hair going again at that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was uh, part of the old highlights and all that. So <laughs> I let I let him do the nasty side of defending, but no, equally no. I love I love that part of defending as well. Um, but yeah, Johnny Nutt on the left side of me, which he was very reliable. He had a great left foot, and then obviously. Barry Barry Fuller was a great fullback, and you just knew he was never going to get beaten in a one on one. So yeah, I, I can't explain why sometimes we did leak a lot of goals, especially obviously. I'm sure the fans remember the seven 0 to Shrewsbury, which was one of those games where you just you just think they're going to score every every occasion. But yeah. you get games like that sometimes. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do think when we were solid, we were really solid. We could have played for hours and hours and not conceded. So, but yeah, that, that part of the back four. I felt good in that back four, and I think I think if you ask Johnny Nutt or Gaz or 
both. One of them probably say the same. That was a good solid back four back unit. Yeah. Um, and then we started having the, some good quality players around us, like Curtis Weston. I was highly rated him. Um, clever player. Yeah, like like you said, Simeon Jackson with the goals up front. Dennis Ollie had the pace down the wings. And then we, we signed Barchi as well, Andy Barchi from Tottenham. So, yeah. on paper, that's a pretty good team. And we had a lot of energy in that team. We had players who want to get on the ball and play a bit of football. And, yeah, I think I think we were starting to go on, like, kind of starting to establish ourselves as a decent, decent team. Yeah. I think so, yeah. I think that defence and the title winning defence are probably my two favourite defences since I've been going to Chilling and yeah. looking at it. It's just, just good memories. And like like you say with Fuller, like even now, like last year he got player of the year, like he might not contribute much going forward anymore, but like he he never gets beat. Never. No, he's a, that's a good trait to have as a full but isn't he? He's always been solid. Yeah. He's always been fit. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I haven't seen him play recently, but he did used to get up and down. Maybe he's obviously getting old what's he now 47, 48 <laughs> <laughs> yeah can't be far <laughs> he, off he yeah. might be um, picking and choosing the times to go forward but <laughs> no nah, fair play to him he's, he's had a great career and, and to be honest he, he had a serious injury the same kind of time as me so yeah. to come back from that is in, incredible and a testament to his character he's, he's non-stop constantly working to get fit again and it just shows he's carried on a very high high standard, isn't he? Yeah, I think I think when he came in, not the summer just gone, but the summer before, like he was just he was just gonna like help the defence be a bit of a backup backup defender. That's all. Yeah. Thing. He went on to get a player of the year. He's played every pretty much every game this season. It's just oh brilliant! I'm pleased, for him, really pleased. Met him a couple of times. He's a really nice guy as well. So yeah, um, he's top man, top fella. Good stuff. And we'll come on to the playoffs. Obviously, a massive thing in a minute, but a little cup run yeah. that season as well in the Aston Villa game. It was on TV. Um, we were in the game, obviously equalised for Simeon Jackson. Um, yeah. They're a massive, massive team. I know they've maybe died off a bit recently, but they came, I think I'm right in saying, they came sixth that season in the Premier League. So, ma- massive. Oh, massive did they? Yeah. Yeah, so really did ourselves yeah. proud then. Um, what, do you remember, yeah. what do you remember from the game and including maybe a couple of dives from a certain player? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I got good night, good dive against me as well. But, yeah. Um, I just look back and I think, I think we've done all right, considering, like you said, they just, Fulfill what finished sixth that season in the Premier League. Um, yeah, to come to Gillingham, and we, I think we gave them a good game, to be honest. And yeah. I, I remember feeling like that in the game as well. Because um, you're always a little bit worried when you've got a Premier League team. Not that I've played many Premier League teams, but you always kind of like, you fear the worst a bit. Um, but yeah, just going into it, you, you're not sure what's going to happen. But then when the game started in the first 20, you say, here we go, we've got a chance here. And then I think they went one nil up, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. And then we got it back to one all. You just, you just felt, I just felt like we was always in the game, and I think we gave them a good, we gave them a good game. And I think they, I think even Martin O'Neill admitted that after the after, after the game in the Olympia. I think he, yeah. he was quite complimentary to us because I think we, we, I think we played pretty well on the day. Being an Aston Villa fan as a kid, I'd have loved to have kept it at one all and gone up to there to the replay but unfortunately that didn't happen because yeah certainly someone had a little dive up didn't he, in the <laughs> but um, Simeon Jackson scored a great goal that was what he was about he, he had that little that turn of pace didn't he and a great finish out past well, someone who had a great career in the Premier League Bradford, was it Brad Friedman goal wasn't it yeah I think it was yeah yeah Yeah. so yeah we were a little bit unlucky I think I think it would have been lovely to get that draw but um, in the end I think we're going to Hold our heads heads high and be proud of that performance. Yeah, even like this um, season, like playing against West Ham, like I think we gave ourselves a good, really good, really good show in like on TV that sort of thing. Is, is good. Yeah, be proud yeah, of that's it. what you want to do. Yeah, you, you want to make yourself proud, don't you, against these against these top boys? Like these are these are players who are playing the Premier League week in week out, and yeah. all you can do is test yourself against them and try and do your best. And I think we we did we did do us, ourselves proud, and um, I'm sure I'm sure you watched it. And, I'm sure you're pretty proud to be sporting at the time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think a little little bit of my mind has always had that resentment towards Ashley Young since that day. Because <laughs> yeah. you never know what yeah, could have been. But... You're not the only one, mate. You're not the only one. Because <laughs> you, you, bu- you got books for fouling him, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I only touched it, mate, to be honest. But <laughs> I think that's maybe, maybe as you go up the leagues, you get a little bit more clever. And, yeah. I know it's a, it's a little bit naughty, but some players do that. And yeah, I think that's what and like I said some players are quite clever about it and can get away with that so yeah, yeah. Nah, but yeah he's a bit naughty but <laughs> never mind did you know as well that was that was James Milner's 23rd birthday and he scored both goals so um, oh, was it there? Yeah, still going strong 23 now 23 at the time 23rd yeah. birthday yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's still going strong now, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. So moving on to the playoffs, the big one. Um, yeah. 
well, big few games, obviously, you've got the semis as well, the semis against Rochdale. Um, yeah. I think, thinking back, we beat them on the last game of the season as well. Um, yeah. Do you think that what? helped things? I, yeah, I saw a little, um, I don't know why, when obviously you, you mentioned about doing this, I, I tried to like, have a little look on YouTube and find some old like, games from that season, and this one come out of the Rochdale game um, before the playoffs, because we actually played them, didn't we? We was already already set in the playoffs so yeah. it was quite like a nothing game and I think Curtis Weston scored a great goal didn't they I think yeah, yeah if I, think I so. remember rightly and then obviously we played them at, went up there again didn't we and played them in the first leg of the playoffs yeah yeah get the nil-nil draw and I suppose job's half done then isn't it well yeah I think that's our game plan um, we knew going up there we had to keep them quiet so I think they had quite a good they had that bag didn't they I think it was LaFondra there as well Adam LaFondra I think he was right, yeah. quite, quite a prolific striker so yeah to go there and keep a clean sheet was obviously, from, from my point of view, was half a job done kind of thing. So we knew we knew that if we get back to Priestfield, we'd, we'd have half a chance of beating them. Yeah, I think a lot of former players have said like in games like that, Priestfield's packed out, like the atmosphere's going going good, like the ball yeah. gets, ball gets sucked in the net really. That's why. Right, yeah, I've mentioned that before. Cause it's called cool, a bit of a cliche. People say the fans are the twelfth man and all that, but I believe that night. That Freefield was rocking, it was a great atmosphere and um I don't think I'd ever experienced it like that to be honest. So Yeah. And those games are so they're so I, I totally enjoyed it because I, I don't know, the bigger the game I I really enjoyed those kind of occasions and the atmosphere and that. Um so yeah, it was really rocking that night and I think we played some good stuff and obviously in the back of your mind you got you got Wembley around the corner, so to come yeah. away two one victory was uh, it was unbelievable. And a lot of my friends and family travelled up. It was a week night, wasn't it? I think. Was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. When, yeah. So yeah, it was just it was just crazy, mate. Just the I just remember the fans coming on the pitch afterwards, and you try <laughs> you want to celebrate with them, but at the same time you can't like get pulled and left or right. <laughs> You're kind of all over the place. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, and I just remember going in the dressing room and everyone was jumping in bottles of champagne spraying everywhere. And those are the moments you can't like live for as a footballer. Yeah. Um, and just brilliant isn't it? something you're never going to forget like, do you yeah. know what I mean I remember I spoke to Matt Fish recently who, who played for the team that we won the league and he's, he said like the pitch invasion like he's, he's got all the adrenaline but like it's just fans like jumping on him like <laughs> everywhere it's crazy it? yeah it, it literally is no it's good it is good and it's good because the fans obviously it's their, their chance to get to Wembley as well like, so it just shows their appreciation they're absolutely buzzing yeah. on the nights as, as, as much as the players were as well. How's the how's the sort of build up to the big game then at Wembley? Yeah, it was it was yeah, I don't really remember much about it. I just remember I remember I think I mentioned it before but we really did work hard on our fitness and we carried that on even even in the gap between the playoffs and the, the Wembley final which which we were quite surprised that we thought we might take it easy but I suppose in one respect you don't want to take your foot off the gas do you? it's been successful all season the, kind of the new fitness regime so you want to carry that on and that's exactly what we did um, we carried on training carried on working hard I think I imagine we had a couple of days off to kind of like recoup and have a few rest days because it obviously it was a long season I think I ended up playing nearly 50 games tonight that season so yeah. it's bound to start taking its toll especially, especially with the highs of the playoffs um, so yeah, it, and then you just start getting, you obviously get all your mates getting in contact and your friends and your family and it's just a build up really, it's just this, it, it was good and you start, it's all the hype building up to it, it's, it's, I've said it before, it's like you're like a kid waiting for Christmas kind of thing, it's just one of your dreams to play at, play at an iconic stadium like at Wembley, so, but I think you got mentioned like Stimo and the staff, now they try to keep us, not stop us getting carried away with the hype. Um, I think yeah. I said it previously that we didn't have suits or anything for the game. I think some people might be quite surprised at that, but it was just another away fixture for us. So That's good you know, away games, yeah, you want to try and keep it normal, certain amount of normality to it. So yeah, we had a new tracksuit made for it, but we never we never went and got measures for suits and all that. Um, so yeah, that, I think that's the mentality you have to go into it thinking it's just another game. I know it's not, but you have to try and convince yourself that and play your normal game. Um, and try not to get too carried away with it. It's just another game. It's two goals, halfway line. It's just you don't want it to pass you by, but equally you don't want to you don't want to try and too hard and not doing yourself justice. So yeah, like you said, it's just another ninety minutes. And I think we, I think even after the seven nil getting hammered by them, I think we we were quietly confident that if we play our game, I think we'd start playing well towards the end of that season. We're solid. 
Uh, we knew we had every chance if we if we played and played to our strengths. We knew we, we I think we knew we could beat Shrewsbury on the day. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned the seven 0 a couple of times, but is that is that because I think we drew two all with them at home as well? So that's nine goals in two games. Like, is that in the back of your mind, or is it just complete clean yeah. slate? Yeah, I think you've got. To, you, yeah, you can't worry about things like that. Well, that's that seven nil was, was a freak result, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get a few results. Like, you still get them now, don't you? That's a few results. Yeah, so you have to try and blank that out. Um, you just go into that game with we were, we were full of full of confidence. I think full of, and you have to believe in yourself. Like, and I, I believe that I was going to try and have a good game and keep Grant Hope quiet, which I still get a lot of tweets about. <laughs> if you let let him out of your pocket in that year. I was I was going to mention <laughs> so, something like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It does crack me up, like so. It's it's nice to see that even even now. How many years ago was it? There was it eleven years ago. Yeah, oh, nine. It's nice yeah. to be remembered, man. It's, it always makes me chuckle when I get tweets about if I let him out. And... <laughs> <laughs> so I say he's still in there somewhere. Yeah, but <laughs> well, he went on, he went on to have a good career, didn't he? So yeah, he certainly did, mate. Yeah, I always say he was. I know we managed to do a job on him at Wembley, but he was he was a good player. I did like playing against him to be honest. He was always a handful. He had yeah. that physicality. He was strong. He was clever as well. He was, he was quite quite clever, a bit like Ashley Long. He, he, even if you'd barely touched him, he'd kind of make a meal of it and go down and get a free kick, which okay. in certain areas, yeah, it's frustrating because you're giving away, you could be giving away a free kick in a crucial area. Yeah. So, yeah, he was always tough, tough to play. I played against him a few times. I always had a good battle with him, but I think we respected each other and it was always a good battle. Did yeah, I, see, I think I see him, see him a year later at the PFA do. Yeah. I'd grown my head when I was injured. I said, I'm. Oh, um, I think I said I wouldn't get it cut until I got fit. So by this stage, another year later, it was really long. Yeah. I just remember it hammering me saying, what the F and you your hair? So was, yeah, no, I, he, was, he was a good lad and tough opponent. Like. I was going to say, did you know him personally? Like, did you speak about that game at all much? Yeah, no, not really personally. I only just played against him like, and that, that rare occasion I see him at the PFA. Yeah. Awards ceremony thing. Yeah. Uh, which was quite funny, but... Yeah, because I remember the whole, the whole, not the whole day, but I remember like on the program that sort of thing. It sort of built as if it was Grant Holt against Simeon Jackson, like two of the top strikers in the league. And I know it was on the front of the program yeah. that sort of thing. Um, and obviously Simeon Jackson had the last laugh that day. So, um, yeah. In a way, though, you're just, you're sort of like the silent hero because you kept Grant Holt quiet for most of it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just going back to Simeon Jackson, I don't think he got enough credit for that. That was a hell of a header. I know, it was. It was behind him, wasn't it? Really? It, yeah, to be honest, he wasn't really renowned for his header ability, was he? As no, well. exactly, exactly. So, and the fact that, yeah, because he got no power, he just managed to direct it in the right that, that area. And, yeah, so you've got to give him credit for that. So a lot of people don't realise how good a header that was. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, like you said, it was it was billed as that, wasn't it? And they both scored a lot of goals that season. And they both went on to have good careers, didn't they, in yeah. higher leagues and... Um, I think they're both at Norwich at the same time, aren't they? I think at some point. So it's always going to be good, good battle between them two, and then equally it would have been good battle between the back four against Grant Holt and whoever was playing up front with him. And fortunately yeah. enough, we managed to come come on top and keep them quiet. I don't, to be honest, I don't think there was many chances that game because you're always a little bit tentative because you've been working hard all season for this one one yeah. game, and yeah. although you give give it everything, you also it's also quite a tense affair as well. And I think that was safe to say. Yeah, you don't want to take any uh, risks or anything like that, do you? So. Yeah, but I think we did. We did look comfortable, especially first half. I, I've watched it a few times. I just once we got the ball down and started playing, we played some good stuff. We never really created as many chances as we would have maybe a light to off. Maybe that was a bit of nerves, but in in the whole, I think we controlled, especially the first half, really well. Yeah, um, and yeah, we couldn't couldn't have scored at a better time, which was. It was all a bit surreal, mate, because obviously at first none of us really knew if it was in or not, because obviously yeah, exactly. we had to keep, Hardly keep went scooped in, did it, it back, didn't he? So, yeah, so we all waited. So, well, Cillian Jackson's off, he knew it was in, so as soon <laughs> as he went off, had a quick look and saw it behind the line and chased after him. Yeah. And then they started doing that silly dance in the corner, which yeah, always yeah. cracks me up, because Gary Richards tried to do the same, <laughs> but... If you see his, his stiff hips and he's got the, no rhythm, so yeah. we should have just left it to them boys. But. <laughs> yeah, I think you can see in the photo when, when the goal goes in, you can see Jackson and then there's Dennis Ollie and then Gary Richards yeah. like in the background trying to catch <laughs> yeah. up with him and that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, he probably couldn't catch him, but we should have just left it, left it to them boys to do the dancing. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure people um, said it to you a million times, but it should have been a goal kick as well, shouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, 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 you don't know it at the time because they didn't really appeal for it. I think one or two of their players did. yeah. But I think it's just one of those decisions you can't like it's that close you just get on with it and worry about it later but unfortunately we, well fortunately for us we scored from it but unfortunately Shrewsbury it should have been a should have been a goal kick shouldn't it but 
Yeah. He seems happy on the football, doesn't he? So he can't. Exactly. I'm sure they're not dwelling on that now, like, but exactly. Exactly. If it, if, yeah. it, if it was given as a goal kick, then not. Or if we didn't score from the corner, no one would even think twice about it. Exactly, yeah. mate. Exactly. So it's yeah. just. Yeah, it was it's great like, times to yeah. score. Like, I'm glad it didn't go to extra time. I think I was. I started to yeah, feel it but then it was also I did mention how hot it was at pitch level that day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was proper, proper hot. And I'd see a few of the boys start to stretch up with cramping there. As I was saying before, like it doesn't matter how fit you are, I think the occasion and the heat, it's gonna to get to an even if you're fit as a fiddle, it's still gonna still gonna take it out of you, absolutely drain you mentally yeah. and physically like. Yeah. It it didn't make a change either, did it, Stinson? No, no, it's been quite a strong bench as well. Yeah. Um but I suppose we we were pretty comfortable most of the way through. It was only the last few minutes when they start chucking players forward. We were a little bit under the posh, but that's expected, isn't it, when you're trying to get back into the game. But yeah, exactly. I always remember my the moment it went in because uh, everyone's standing up like for the corner. And I was... So, as you're looking at the pitch, the goal was to the left of me. I was like on the halfway line and... I didn't see the ball go in because everyone was stood up and I was so short because I was only 10 and my dad literally <laughs> just picked me up and he was just body slamming me like <laughs> I don't even know what's going on I don't remember I didn't see the ball go in everyone's just going mental my dad's like chucking me all over the place no, really? I was like oh, what's but, going on but that's good memories so obviously not only me when I remember this about but also for the fans being there that day and yeah I suspect, I suspect that's great memories for you in it that last minute goal and yeah Celebrations and you just—I just remember seeing a sea of blue behind that stadium, uh, behind that behind that goal. Yeah. And just when that goes in, everyone just—it's just the euphoria of the it's brilliant and the last like seconds, and that must be pretty special for the fans looking back as well. Yeah, I'd like—I'd love another moment like that now, like something, yeah. something that can match it. That's the thing, they're few and far between, so you've got to cherish those moments. And exactly. I just kept thinking, I wouldn't mind scoring because I think a few of my mates stuck a 20 quid or 10 on me to score. The first <laughs> oh, goal, really? and I think I was 50 to 1, I think. So, <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> drinks would have been definitely on there if I had scored, but unfortunately, didn't have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd have been in there for the yeah. corner, surely. Yeah, I was up there for the corner, yeah, but. Actually, it fell to the right player at the right time, didn't it? Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's interesting. Job done. Because I always remember where the dugout was because I'm pretty sure the trophy was lifted below me so I couldn't really see it. But where I go to... Oh, really? Yeah, where I go to university now, I don't know if you're aware of it. Yeah. It's called UCFB and the campus is inside Wembley Stadium. Um, oh, is it? Yeah, I so that, it's a it's a football uni, and they have a they have another one at the Etihad. But literally, like three days a week, we're just in the stadium. Like we basically have lessons in the boxes, so you can see the pitch literally yeah. every day. I know which goal it was. Every time I could just see that header going in, <laughs> like <'cause> yeah. <laughs> like first ever oh, visit man, to Wembley man. that happened, and now yeah, now I get to see it every it, day. <laughs> it is some stadium, and it? it is an impressive stadium there. It is, it is, it's mental. It's weird though, because yeah. like now because I live like basically right next to it like walking down Wembley Way when there's no one there it's just weird because you're <laughs> yeah, just used to it it's a bit weird though, isn't it? yeah a bit surreal so obviously we get get the promotion and um, yeah I know you obviously had the injury which we'll come on to in a little bit um, yeah what were the ambitions going back into League One um, I, I, it's difficult to say really because obviously you just come back you're still on a high from that Wembley I think that's, I think in anyone's career that's going to be a personal high yeah. And and for the team, so you just I think you're just still still excited. I think you've got that that nervous feeling. You want you're back in back in League One from the disappointment of the season before. So I don't think there's no expectations. I thought I think we had quite a good squad back then. So I think I think we were hoping to build on it um, and just go again. Really, I mean, we knew we were going to. I think we were done all right in League One, um, but unfortunately we got relegated. But I didn't play any part of that season. So yeah. Um, there wasn't no expectation. I think we just went went into it. We, we were all excited. We knew we knew what we needed to do. We knew come back from pre season. We had a good rest of the, over the summer and go on your holidays and whatnot. Spend some time with your family and, that. and then it's just back to it. It's just like any normal season. You just go into it and just hope you do as well as you can. Yeah, absolutely. And we do unfortunately have to talk about injury because it's quite a big part of your story. <laughs> nah, that's right, mate. Yeah, no problem. Um, I've watched a previous interview you've done and yeah, you said you weren't meant to be playing in the game at Bromley where you got the injury. Yeah, I think that was the case. I'm, I'm not 100%, but I'm sure, because like I said in the previous interview, we, we used to go away with Chidlam to France. I think the chairman had some kind of, uh, I don't know, some, a few links out there. I think it was the 2K. We used to go every season when I was yeah. there. And we just got back. And I, I don't think I was supposed to be playing. I'm sure there was a few trialists were supposed to play in that Bromley game and for one reason or another they didn't play and 
I think I was only supposed to, did I play, was it the second half, wasn't it? I'm pretty sure. Maybe I was only supposed to play the first half, but I ended up playing a few more minutes in the second. Obviously, that's when it happened. Um, I don't really remember much about it. I just remember going up for head and just getting a slight nudge off balance. And, you know, when you normally land, you kind of like brace yourself, you bend your knees. But where I'd got knocked off balance, I landed straight legs. Right, I yeah. just uh, heard this big click and clunk as I landed. I just... I think as a, I had a few injuries. I don't have anything serious, but I think as a footballer, you kind of know when something's not right. Uh, that I didn't even try to walk on it because I looked down. I just see this. It looked like a, someone put a golf ball in my sock. Yeah, it just literally ballooned up straight away, and I just thought this this isn't right now. So, and yeah. that was the start of my car injury. How really? Yeah. So you knew straight away, did you really? Well, I, I say that I look back and um, I think when I had scans and operations and saw specialists. They did say my my ankles were starting to deteriorate. As I think a lot of footballers do get um, cartilage problems and they do start to deteriorate just because football is such a high impact sport. Yeah. Um. Where, where I've been playing it for like twenty years or so, and I did start getting a few more knocks, and I did notice it was taking long to recover my ankles. I don't know if you remember that, that Shrewsbury game you touched on, where we were winning two 0 at Priest. I actually come off last ten minutes, gone. It was just so, just a little, little tap of my ankle, but yeah. where they were starting to get a little bit more damage, it, I couldn't. I literally, if I did get a knock on it, I was struggling to carry on in games. Yeah, um, and I did start to get a few more over that, that few year period. I think that was kind of like the final nail in the coffin that game at Bromley. Yeah, um, yeah, and it was just, it was straight in for a scan. The, the worst thing about it was, I don't know, I don't know if I've spoke to many people about this, but the next, when I had the scan, um, they actually said it wasn't too bad. Um, oh, really? They said, yeah, yeah, which was a bit. I, I completely forgot about that. Yeah, they didn't think it was nowhere near as severe or serious as it ended up being. So I think I was kind of like on a positive note, thinking, oh, yeah, it might only be a couple of weeks. But obviously, it was a couple of weeks turned into a couple of months, which into, <laughs> turned into a couple of years. But yeah. there's nothing I could do about it, unfortunately. It was just one of those things. It was just, unfortunately, the nature of the injury, the cartilage. Oh, I won't get into too many details. It, it doesn't heal itself, and all a couple of operations, it never, it doesn't repair itself. So, especially my my style of game, I was going out for a lot of headers, a lot of tackles. It's a high impact sport at the best of times football. So, um, trying to play play your game and that with barely no cartilage in your ankles is pretty pretty painful and yeah. end up getting unbearable. Yeah, yeah, I imagine, I imagine that's that's horrible. Like, I'm yeah, not, I'm not at it, but I imagine it's it's very painful. Um, yeah, and you mentioned you missed the whole of the next campaign, um, the relegation yeah. campaign. How involved were you with the squad in terms of like um, training? Yeah, I found it hard to be honest. I felt because I didn't want to get too involved because I was playing no part. So I know I know you hear stories like some players. Especially at high levels, if uh, key key players, they still stay involved. And do you know what I mean? But I, I, I tend to try and stay the stay stay out of the way because I, I had no influence on the team. Then, so I do think it'd be my place to kind of like pipe up and say stuff or try and get involved in any any aspect. So I kept myself to myself. I think the first, I think I had an operation pretty shortly after I did the injury and. I had I went home for three months. Went back to Whitney. Went back to Oxford for three months. I was, it was completely non weight bearing, yeah. so I just I, know, I was on crutches. So I didn't have anyone around me at that time. So the best thing was to do was go and live with my mum and dad for so they could kind of help me out. Because obviously, when you're on crutches and you're on your own, you can't even make a cup of tea. I remember struggling to do that. Like you know what I mean? So yeah. I think still I was quite quite helpful. He said, "Yeah, get yourself back to Whitney, back to Oxford. Spend I think it was three months completely non weight bearing." So. Yeah, I did that and then come back in and that's when I started my rehab and obviously I still go to games and now I come to the games after that three month period and uh, I can't remember that much this because when you don't play the games I don't really remember to be honest obviously I know we got relegated obviously but yeah. Um, yeah. I just had to try and try and do my rehab which I found hard um, and just try and get back to fitness yeah. which turned out to be a lot, hell of a lot harder and what was your rehab like what was the process um, I couldn't really do much that was the problem um, because of your ankle you, you, I tried to do a little bit of gym work but I just kept thinking in my head oh, once I get back to the training ground once I start training I'll be alright and get my fitness that way right. yeah soon I think even that, that first session when I when they told me I could wait there so basically I'd go down to the training ground do some light running I just knew something wasn't right it was just I was still in agony and I just I said I think I said to the physio at the time I said this doesn't feel right at all yeah. it was just constant really mate I couldn't run and 
I, I can't really remember what happened after that. Um, I think I carried on rehab, broke down. It was just a case of that. And then each time I tried to come back, something else in my body would let me down. Because the problem with my ankles, when you start running differently, it affects the rest of your body. So I started picking up yeah. hamstring injuries yeah. where my alignment wasn't right. I started having back problems. So it was just kind of like one thing after another, which is quite common in long-term injuries. The rest of your body starts playing up. So that's why I've kind of got so much respect for people like Ledley King. Because I know he had similar problems with his knee and, he could barely train, but I think he, someone said he swum a lot through the week for his fitness. But right. come Saturday, he, he was still an unbelievable player. I was just thinking, how the hell could, how the hell has he still managed to keep that kind of like the elite level yeah. while not training? Because I think I was, well, I was never naturally fit, so I needed, I relied on training hard, and I think I always did put put my hard, like put a lot of hours in training, work hard, and I think when at that stage where I was well I was training hard and training well that's when my performance were kind of at their best so when I couldn't train I, I had no chance really so I, I wasn't naturally fit I didn't have that natural ability and natural fitness I always had to work on it yeah yeah that's fair enough and so, in terms yeah. of the mental side of it how how did you keep yourself sort of upbeat mentally um I don't I think at first year I wasn't too bad so I always thought I'd come back it wasn't until the following season I was still struggling it wasn't I think that's when men started struggling with it all um, but that first was that first year I think like I said you always think you've got a chance of coming back and coming back to Simon King of old kind of thing so yeah um, yeah so mentally I didn't find it too hard it was it was obviously difficult because you're not involved and it's taken away from you but I always believed I would make a comeback at some point it wasn't until breaking down on a few occasions playing and not playing well and just not not getting fit it was, that's when I started to struggle still with, and come to terms with it kind of thing yeah I've seen a, a few photos recently of like um, when you picked up injuries and you just look gutted every time like yeah 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 I just it, yeah a couple of occasions I did kind of feel half fit and then my ankles were obviously painful but I kind of like I, I thought I could get through it and then my hamstring went I think it was a way to crew or something like that a way to Plymouth I was struggling I just, I just found it so hard to get through 90 minutes I don't know why considering before my injury I had no problem I picked up a few little injuries but do you know what I mean it was just it was just a shock to the system and unfortunately the rest of my body not only my ankle was letting me down it was I was picking up other little niggly, niggly injuries so it was just one of those things where I just couldn't couldn't get fit I couldn't train um, I was supposed to train every other day and then, and then it's difficult to get your fitness back you struggle to get your sharpness and at the same I wasn't getting any younger so yeah it's fighting a lot of factors kind of thing yeah obviously you missed the season but when um, we were relegated at Wickham um, on, yeah. on goal difference um, and Mark Stimson leaves Andy Hesentale comes in obviously you're still sort of struggling with the injuries what, what did he say to you when he came in? Um, I think cause I think me and Gary were both Gary Richards still at the club um, and he just basically said he wanted me fit and I think I went away that summer I think even the chairman rang me up and said enough's enough now you've been out all season I think he he was to try, try to arrange some kind of other fitness regime for me I think I went went and done some work with a private physio uh, for months and months because part of my rehab where I can't do impact work because of my own cartilage he used to put me on this running machine but he used to used to put it around your waist it used to fill up with air so it was kind of like yeah. running not all impact I can't remember the name of the machine now. so I did a lot of work on that and I did start to kind of like get fit and although I was in pain probably 99% of the time I don't think I'd ever, I'd, I still get pain from my ankles now but um, yeah I think it was Hesse brought a few more defenders in so I knew I was never going to get first choice again um, so I just had to try and mentally stay stay kind of like positive and if I did get a chance back in the first team try and take it and I think I had a few went on loan to Plymouth um, didn't do too bad down there played a few games uh, still still obviously struggling with my ankle but I thought I might might manage to kind of like get back to somewhere near the player I was um, and then yeah I think I played a few games coming back from Plymouth we started off that season quite well if I remember rightly and yeah, then yeah, we yeah. kicked off we had a I think we had a bad period where we we lost about five games in a row. And I think I think it was Andy Frampton come in playing left centre half. I think he might have got injured or suspended. And I had a chance, and I actually didn't do too bad. I played a few games. Uh, I remember one played away to Cheltenham, and they were flying high at the time. We beat them three 0 after Christmas kind of period. So I played about four or five games where 
I started getting back to kind of like the player I was, but just never, I was never going to kind of like reach the highs that I did that promotional season. Obviously, the goal against Torquay was one of my special moments. Um, after the promotion, see after after all that injury hell, um, so it's nice nice to score that goal and give give the Jules faithful one last kind of like cheer to celebrate with them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And another highlight I'm sure was was the comeback at Rotherham. Um, yeah, that's right, mate. Yeah, because that was on my birthday. Because I remember it. Oh, was it? Uh, yeah, the three one win was on my birthday. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> that must have been quite quite relieving for you as well. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, it was a whole load of emotions that night. It was. I was. I was nervous. I was like, it's like being because I didn't like coming. I, I did that a few times in my career coming off the bench. I found it always quite hard. Wow. It's hard to get get into the game, so I was a bit nervous in that respect. And it was like being a kid making your debut. I've been out so long, and then yeah, I think we were quite a good team back then. I think they had some decent players. So it's come on. And I think did you say we won three one, didn't we? Three one, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just remember the. Um, Kind of like the fans want to come on. It was great to hear that. That was that was something special. That did give me goosebumps coming on and kind of like the round of applause I got. And then also at the end of the game, I think I I think I was nearly in tears. Like just getting through that game and getting yeah. the result and being back at the pre field and being like clapping the fans at the rain and end. It was something so I loved doing. I think I did nearly nearly break down then that, that night. It just it just felt so it just felt so good after that long being out. Um, Obviously, that was all short lived, wasn't it? I didn't play. Like, I played many more games after that, unfortunately. Yeah, there was a couple of years um, under Hess when we missed out on the playoffs a couple of times, and I know you had your injury problems and that. But how was it missing out on the playoffs for two years in a row under Hess? Yeah, I can. I obviously not. I didn't really play many games. I was on the bench a few times and played a few games. Yeah, but obviously gutted because it's still my club. Like, do you know what I mean? I was there. Yeah. I was still a player there. And, as much as I wanted to get and play every game, I, I knew I couldn't kind of thing. So I had to try and try to try and train hard and stay positive around the lads. And I, of course, you, they're your teammates, you want them to do well and you want the club to do well. And obviously, when you're not playing regularly, there's not much you can do about it. You can only, I don't, I don't feel I'm warranted of really staying in place that often, just because it's purely my fitness levels. And um, yeah, it was good. And even even not being a big part of the team because you you want to you want to be part of a successful team and you want the lads around you to do well. Um, I've got some good friends there. Obviously, Gary Rich is still there. And yeah. Charlie, Chris Welp, they all come in. I used to travel in with them from Brentwood wow. into football. And they're your mates. You want to see them doing well. And unfortunately, just missing out was was not good really. And I think a club the size of Gillingham should be in League Two. They should be in League One. Yeah. If yeah. Not yeah, yeah, and no, I completely agree with you. Um, it, was, mm. it was a shame that your departure came the year before we won the league because I'm sure that would have been brilliant to be a part of as well. Yeah, um, I'm, yeah. Sure, I'm sure that would have would have definitely helped. The release before just before that season, um, I've seen before you said you sort of knew it was coming, but how did it come about? Yeah, it was. Um, I had a chat with obviously it was Hesse, the manager at the time, and she said I wasn't going to be getting get the release. I think we were close to doing maybe. I think. I can't remember, I'm sure we had a chat maybe about a more uh, pay-as-you-play kind of contract, but nothing really materialised from that. Okay. It was more completely drop your wages, but it was higher appearance money. So I think some, some players on contracts like that, where you basically just get a little bit more money if you play the games, where your basic wage is quite small, but yeah. nothing really materialised, and I, I didn't expect it to. And I just remember Hesse saying that, there was no contract there for me. I'd be getting released in the summer, and I was half expecting anyway. And there was no bit in this. I wasn't like, oh, I thought I thought I'd get a new deal. I was, oh yeah, I, I didn't worry to uh, cut up playing enough games or putting enough performances to get a new deal. And I knew, I knew maybe my time was up at Jills and I knew maybe my football career was coming close to an end. Um, so I think that was the hardest thing. Not only getting released, um, it was kind of like maybe going away in the summer and having a good long sit down and think about what I'm going to do. Yeah. Yeah, and you did you did carry on. Um, yeah, and we spoke about it a bit before, again before we start recording. But you went up to Scotland to play for Inverness. How did that happen? Yeah, well, it was quite. It was yeah, it was all a big turnaround. I kind of like started my career again. So I actually went back to Barnet that summer. Um, I don't know if you remember, but Rob Robbo was number two under Stimo for a bit. He was actually in charge of Barnet, and I got I got in touch with him, and I just wanted to train really and see how it was and. With no pressure and just see how see how I was going. And I was, I was training all right to be honest. I know I was getting a little bit older and um, yeah, so I had a couple of weeks there at Barnet. Um, then just finished training out the blue. I had a phone call and it was Terry Butcher, 
I thought it was a wind up. I thought someone was winding me up here. Yeah. And he said, How would you like to come up to Inverness for a season? Well, it was just an initial trial kind of period, just go up there and see how I like it. And so it's only around the corner at Inverness. Jeez, it took me about nine hours to drive up there. <laughs> I, think I, I think I flew up there the first couple of times. And then when I did sign them, I took my car up there. And um, yeah, so yeah, it was, it's, a, it's a lovely little club, Inverness, a beautiful part of Scotland. And I enjoyed it up there, mate. I played the first four games and Played away at Hearts, which is a uh, lovely stadium, and drew to all. Played, a couple, played against Celtic. I always remember gave away a bit of a sloppy goal against that Tony One, and a few of my mates said, "Oh, what you good doing there?" And I always come back because he scored against Barcelona a couple of weeks later, so I didn't feel too bad after I yeah. still scored against Barcelona. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, I started having problems with my other ankle, similar kind of cartilage problems. So yeah. uh, another operation, had a bit bit of time off up there, and. And that's when I decided to quit it there after having a few lengthy conversations with Terry Butcher himself. He kind of like, players like that, kind of like, who've had a great career and iconic. Obviously, you know the the bandage and the blood net. Yeah, when yeah. he when he kind of like gives you advice, you kind of like listen. And I had a couple of chats with him, and he gave me some good advice, and he looked after me when I was out there, and very grateful to him. And that was when I finally pulled the plug on my career. Am I right saying you play for Thorock? Yeah. Yeah, and that was, um, yeah, I had a few years out and then started a you know, completely different kind of changing career. I started just working normally, like I'm still doing what I'm doing now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was Mark, Mark Stimson was in charge. So, and it, was, it said that was only about 15 minutes from my house. So I thought I'd give it a go. I was missing it. I, was, I don't know if I ever got over the, the fact that I had to retire and call it a day. And although I knew I'd. <laughs> I still going to be in a lot of pain. It was it was part time club, and I thought that might try and suit me a little bit better. So yeah, uh, yeah, I really trained like Tuesday, Thursday, and game on Saturday. And, and to be honest, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed starting playing again. I I fell in love with the game for a couple of years, and and then just being around the training ground, well not tra- uh, training on Tuesday, Thursday, being around the lads and that co- co- come around you have in the dressing room, I missed all that. So when Stimo said you want to come and give it a go down at far, I can't. I uh, leaped to the chance and really enjoyed it. And you say yeah. retirement was quite hard for you, was it? Yeah, I fell out of love with, it, with, with football completely because I think I always think back and I think if I was a little bit later on in my career and just re- retired due to age and getting a little bit older, I think it would be a lot lot easier to deal with. But because I was kind of like just coming into my peak and just had the best season of my, my career kind of thing, that promotion season, it was it was even harder to take. And, yeah. No, I, don't, I don't think you ever get it there because it's like what I said to people before imagine something you love doing is just taken away from you something you can't do um, just overnight really wasn't it it was literally one one challenge and that was it yeah and I don't want to try and like bring a downer on it but maybe it was a bit of yeah. what could have been sort of thing yeah that's another thing you have to try and come to terms with as well what ifs yeah you, know, you just don't yeah it could have been completely different you never know do you, you never know what's around the corner I think that's that's always hard to deal with as well some people I thought I could have made it like Championship and Premier League and, that, and you, you just don't know that's the, that's the hardest thing you just don't know what could have been kind of thing and do you want to touch a little bit on what you are doing now because I know especially in the current current climate um, you're, you're helping out yeah, a bit of course, yeah. yeah I've been working for a delivery company um, for a few years now I've got a franchise room so I'm self-employed with them um, and yeah to be honest mate it's, since the lockdown it's been it's been absolutely flat out. It's, it's like Christmas all over again for us. And that's our busiest period. So I've yeah. seen a lot of people online, online shopping. But it's difficult in a way because I've still got a young 19-month-old daughter. So I don't, I'm taking a little bit of risks. And obviously, I'm not comparing myself to... We, we're classed as key workers, but I know the real key workers at the NHS are so doing an amazing job at the minute. Yeah. Um, they're the real heroes. But I like to think we're doing our bit. We're, we're delivering a lot of food parcels. Um Especially to older, I've got I do the same area. I've been doing the same area for a couple of years, so you get to know your people you deliver to. Um, so the few older, elderly kind of people on my route, which I deliver food parcels and other bits and bobs. So it's nice to kind of make sure they're alright. And yeah, I always like having a chat with them and make sure they're okay and they recognise me from where I've been delivering to them for a few years. So yeah, yeah so I'm out on the road, mate, doing deliveries and yeah, trying to stay safe at the same time, um, but also doing my bit, which which feels good. I look at people like, like the NHS workers yourself. My girlfriend's a teacher, so she's going in every day looking after like the oh, yeah. vulnerable children and stuff like that. And I'm, I think, yeah. I think of myself sitting here doing journalism and I think I'm so useless compared <laughs> to all these people. But um, yeah, no. there we go. There we go. Um, yeah. 
so what does the future hold for you? Are you just sort of aiming to carry on what you're doing, that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah, I think so, mate. Yeah, at the minute, I'm kind of puts a, pays the bills, puts a roof over my head, so I'm quite happy doing that. And once you're out on the road, you're kind of like your own boss, so. Yeah. Um, but in the back of my mind, I've always, I've always wanted to try and get back into football. Um, I think that's partly one of the reasons I went with to throw it with Stimo because I thought there might be a chance of maybe getting into a bit of coaching. Yeah. Uh, through that that aspect, but nothing really materialised there from when I left. Um, I'd lo- I'd, yeah, I'd love to. It's always in the back of my mind. I'd love to get back into football. Um, but also, I know what it's like for coaches. I know how difficult it is and how cutthroat football can be. Yeah. Um, so in terms of security and it's, it's difficult, isn't it? Yeah. I'd love to just give up this job and go and try and get a football job, but if that doesn't happen. I mean, I'm like anyone else. I've still got a mortgage to pay. I've still got a family to support. So yeah, at this current time, yeah, I've got a job which pays the bills and keeps the roof over my head, keeps me providing my family. But if there's an opportunity later on in life, um, even if it's just kids, kids football, I'd love to. I'd love to coach them. That's still my passion. That's still something I love doing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, one day, mate, I'd like to I'd like to try and get into it in some capacity, give something back to a sport which I love doing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I think pretty much if you're even if you're going to like the kids team, like anyone can really coach them if you sort of start start working on it. So maybe it's yeah, you could get into in the future. That's it. Um, yeah, that's it. And just finally, a question I've start sort of tried to start asking the people we have on. Um, could yeah. we ever see you back at Gillingham one day in any form? Um, yeah, I don't see why not. If the opportunity come along, I'd love, love to go back there. It's a it's a club close to my heart. Um, yeah, I think when you when you look back at my career, and clubs, uh, all the clubs are kind of special in different ways. But um, especially with Jin and that Wembley, that Wembley in the playoff games, it just remains really close to my heart. That club. Um, so yeah, I'd love to go back there at some point. I'd like to come back. I, I should make an effort to come to a few more games. Really, I know I don't really get an opportunity that much now with having a young baby in that. But yeah. obviously, when this lockdown finishes and if football ever does return, it feels. I'm missing um, losing a load of money going to accumulate to the weekends at the minute. But uh, one day if football starts again, I'd love to get down to a few more games in there. Yeah, maybe we could have another playoff final soon. Who knows? Something like that. <laughs> yeah, that'd be good, man. I'd def- definitely come to that. Yeah, that'd be good. In with the Jules fans. But yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, Simon, it's been absolutely brilliant. I really appreciate you coming on. It's been great to chat and obviously talk about old times, oh, that sort of thing. Absolutely brilliant. Um, and Pleasure, yeah. mate. Pleasure anytime. Thank you. Nice one. So that is that for this episode of JFG Meets. I'd like to give another huge thank you to Simon for taking the time out of his day to chat to me. Please do like the video if you enjoyed and feel free to leave a comment and subscribe to the channel as well. Please check out all of our other platforms which can be found in the description and do let us know anyone else related to the club do you think we should get on the show in the future. We do have a few episodes lined up already so keep an eye out for those and please check out all of our previous episodes as well if you fancy it. See you soon.